I am Lawrence Chuno, and this is Doing Jazz. Hello everyone, Happy New Year, and welcome to a brand new season of Doing Jazz. My name is Lawrence Chuno, and this episode is with saxophonist Michael Eaton. Michael Eaton belongs to a distinguished class of multi-episode Doing Jazz guests. This is his second time on the show. In addition to coming from a well-informed set of musical inspirations, Michael Eaton's compositions usually have a wide range of intellectual and philosophical underpinnings that gives each listener something to reflect upon. In 2019, Michael Eaton released two albums, Dialogical and Tenor Triage. Dialogical is a solo project. Tenor Triage is an album Michael fronted with saxophonists James Brandon Lewis and Sean Sonderegger. The song playing in the background is called Juno. During my conversation with Michael, you'll hear the songs Anthropocene, Aphoristic, and Machinic Errors. These songs are all from the album Dialogical. Towards the end of the conversation, you'll hear the song The Beatdown from the album Tenor Triage. After listening to this episode, you can learn more about Michael Eaton by going to the website of the show www.doingjazz.net You can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter. The handle is at doingjazz. And you can listen to more episodes of Doing Jazz by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the available podcast vendors. If you're on Spotify, please follow the Doing Jazz playlist. A one-stop playlist for songs by all the Doing Jazz guests so far. While on iTunes, please rate the show, leave a comment, and share the show with your loved ones. Please consider donating to Doing Jazz so that we can continue to bring the show to you. The donation link can be found on the website of the show, www.doingjazz.net. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I present Michael Eaton in your face. the microphone you see <laughs> but I can't. people are gonna get mad i'm sorry okay We're why would they get mad though why uh, can't they separate the artist i, from I agree i agree I'm at like, the end, he's still decided. funny it's still funny yeah. i mean it's it's horrifying but it's still funny it's whatever anyway he's an institution and he's gonna continue to be though a corrupt institution and you understand <laughs> so yeah. he's, he's always an institution it's just like yeah 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 totally <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, I have a friend, my friend Adam Minkoff can do like a drop dead impression of him. Of him. <laughs> and it's, it, and he's a big, he's a huge Bill Cosby fan. Mm-hmm. And like, it's just like, we do a little impression. Because it's fun. <laughs> and, and, but now people are like, people get offended almost. And I'm like, I don't, it's I don't, just funny. I don't get it. It's still funny. I don't get it. Seriously. Yeah. I think, I think he always continue to be big. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, I, and I, corrupt stuff could still be big you know yeah like r kelly when i heard they were going to like remove throw, all his stuff from him, yeah. yeah remove all his stuff from like spotify i'm like okay there are some songs i actually really like maybe i should download yeah. them before they get rid of it yeah <laughs> I, I agree i mean if you, you i you gotta 
be able to separate the artist from the uh, the, mu- the artist as a musician from their work from their person. Yeah, and that's like otherwise, like everybody's gonna be indicted for something. Yeah, I know, I know. Michael Ethan, <laughs> <Here> we <laughs> welcome go. to doing just Ethan, right? That's right. Ethan. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you again. Thank you. So, how has it been musically? Musically, yeah. there has been. Um, Oh, fair about going on since I last saw you, which I believe was 2016. Okay. And uh, see, 2016 was the year that I recorded Dialogical with Leonel Weke and a host of other guests. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2017, I did a concert with my good friend Adam Minkoff on bass. We co-produced this concert that was a late Coltrane tribute uh, we'd always wanted to do, or I'd always wanted to do music from Interstellar Space, which is kind of like a landmark, yeah. super deep album and we did it with david liebman on saxophone and mark rebo on guitar and jamie saft on uh, piano and then anthony cole and nick anderson on drums and my friend uh, make off on bass and so that was a big event for me and then been playing a lot with my friend cheryl pyle the great jazz flutist in like a free improvised setting yeah. that she calls beyond group mm-hmm. and um uh I Sh- ha- you say cheryl pyle cheryl pyle yeah i she contacted me once mm-hmm. to interview her and i replied her and i never heard back from her oh well i'm sure she would still be interested yeah okay uh i'd like to talk to her it could be an electronics thing who knows like uh, email or yeah you know like um her building has had all these weird issues with she lives in manhattan right yeah she's lower side okay and then um uh i have a band called tenor triage which is with james brandon lewis on tenor saxophone Mm -hmm. sean sonreger on tenor saxophone and then when we recorded with this with this band in uh, late 2017, it was with Brad Jones on bass and Calvin Wesson on drums. So that, that's yeah. awesome. It's Thank it's you. pretty difficult, yes, uh, to do that. I, I mean, think so. and this business, it's a yeah. You're the definitely doing more than a lot of people. Well, thank in, you. I feel yeah. like I'm doing less. I don't know. <laughs> I think you're doing way more. Like, you have an album that just came out. Mm-hmm. Um, Dialogical. Dialogical, like mm-hmm. two months ago. Yeah. And then you're t- talking about something new coming up mm-hmm. again. And you've been doing a whole lot uh, before then. Um, yeah. Yeah. So how do you how do you set up your gigs? How do you book them? <laughs> I just do probably the same thing that, that you do. I contact... Um, Rockwood Music Hall, you know, I have a long time connection there with okay. um, Minkoff used to play there all the time and, and I've played there. Um, in fact, um, I usually ask, ask me what I've been up to. I mean, I did a great gig with Tim Hagens, the wonderful uh, trumpet player, former Blue Note artist mm-hmm. in, back in December. And, and that was at stage three. Um, I also for uh, like a year or so was a member of iBeam, an artistic collective in... Um, I guess it's Gowanus or South Park Slope. Okay. And that was like you paid a certain amount of month uh, per month and you uh, get the space a certain amount of time each month. And as long as the slot is available, mm-hmm. you can book it. So for a while, I was kind of going like, I don't even want to deal with like, you know, like like um, trying to book gigs and, and draw mm-hmm. a crowd, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I just want to like put it put on a show and have people if they want to mm-hmm. come. I don't have pressure. And this is one space. Yeah, it's okay. one room in okay. in um yeah, like I guess South Slope and it's it's nice. I mean they have a nice piano, that's that's a big plus. Yeah. They have a drum set, they have good equipment, they have amps and that sort of thing. Um I'm not a member currently, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I hope to come back at some point. But um, how how do how do they get draws? Like how do people It's really Do they have like an inbuilt crowd? They I think they they used to and mm-hmm. it's dwindled in that respect um i I think it's really um dependent upon the artist and coming upon the artist like sometimes no one would be in my stuff Mm -hmm. or sometimes if you had a certain lineup people would would come out um it's also geographically one of those places that's like you know it's it's just off the beaten path enough that that that's another challenge yes Um, yeah and there's another you know there's another well-known spot in Brooklyn mm-hmm. that's kind of like has the same challenge that's like it's just off enough off the beaten path that you've got to bring your people mm-hmm. I think, I think mm-hmm. you know but that's that's kind of how I've been doing it and then sometimes if it's like a, a, a tour just um, googling places and having you know musicians recommend places to me and then following up and then you know I feel I feel like I mean you can probably relate to this it's like juggling things where some people will yeah. be like we can't do it right now yeah. and then you know other people yeah. will be like oh welcome aboard and mm-hmm. so um 
it's just kind of like constant overturning. But I feel like for me, I've had some places that are stable that are relatively like I can go to and book them. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, mm-hmm. it's not that challenging, thankfully. You know? Yeah. Um, National Sawdust, we had kind of a uh, connection that was able to get us, a couple connections that were able to get us booked there with probably a little bit more ease. But mm-hmm. it was, you know, I'm, I'm trying to book something there. Again, I hope I can I can play there because it's a wonderful space, amazing space. And um, that's just kind of like, you know, keeping, keeping the emails going, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Emails, yes. Yeah, <laughs> you just gotta keep sending sending out those emails. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. Keep it rolling. <laughs> yeah, keep it rolling. I'm not always the best at that. Uh, I try. Oh, I suck at that. Like I just have accepted that I'm not good at that. <laughs> you know. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to like keep that regularity. Yeah, sometimes I just get so tired and so. Mm-hmm depressed by the whole thing that i'm like okay i'm just gonna back <laughs> i'm just gonna back away for like three months and then yeah. i'm gonna come back yeah <laughs> and rejuvenate my spirit yeah I've, I've actually uh been going to therapy for anxiety and mm. i'm i'm like i have some pretty straightforward straight ahead medications and mm-hmm. i took off like seven months from mm-hmm. booking my my own band i still took um side person gigs Mm -hmm. but i i made a choice for a bit aside from that tim hagan's gig in december i was like under enough internal stress that i was just decided like i'm going to take a hiatus from this and i'm feeling Mm. like getting back on the horse now which is good but yeah i think sometimes you have to take those breathers or i don't know so it's uh, you know like i'm thinking about like sonny rollins back in the 60s or i think he took at least three sabbaticals over uh, his career if not more and Mm -hmm. and i'm like looking at the wisdom of that going like yeah that's i get it like if you were especially in that era Mm -hmm. working like 200 nights a year or something they i mean they had that amazing life and like um in that respect you Mm -hmm. know I would I would want to break too, you know. Yeah. I would, I think I would get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm cool on money, I'm cool, I got a place to live. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take a break and actually and, and also sit down and think about the instrument too yes. because I think yeah. it's yeah. that yeah. I'm sure they were doing the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. when he went up on the bridge and he was like re-examining his his craft and mm-hmm. re-examining what he wanted to do. Um I can relate to that. Yeah. Um I, I, I've tried to do the idea of the artist retreat, but I've never been that successful. And I, mm-hmm. there's, there's too many other things like, you know, I go home and visit my folks and yeah. I want to like the ideal is to be able to like, Oh, I'm going to spend so much time with the saxophone. And, yeah. and then like you see people and you want to hang out and you want to, and that kind of falls by the wayside. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm just saying this because um, when I went to David Liebman's master class in, in 2012, he mentioned this tradition that various people have done in, in classical music and jazz, like probably Stravinsky, but I mean, the great Steve Coleman mm-hmm. does this and Liebman had done it at one point, but like the idea of an artist's retreat mm-hmm. um, every year, I mean, I've heard Coleman does it every year. I don't know, but like going somewhere and, and kind of hiding yourself away or, 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 or touring or traveling, but like getting that inspiration and input from, so that, so let me use a different word than input, but like, mm-hmm. you know, getting more information and reassessing and going, what do I want to do next? Or what, what am I working on? I think that's, that's really positive. If, yeah. if you can, if you can swing it, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. th- these cycles happen and it's yes. good. And like you mentioned, um, Anxiety is real and a lot of yeah. things and I don't think I've been diagnosed and I think mm-hmm. it's because I've been too lazy <laughs> oh, no, to well, pursue it. But yeah. something happened to me mm-hmm. uh, in March, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I just, it was like a reaction. Like I was walking too much. It was mm-hmm. just like, yeah. In the morning, I'm going to wake up. I want to finish this. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to meet this deadline. And then I had this migraine. And I I usually have migraines, but I had this migraine. And Mm -hmm. then it lasted for like close to three months. uh, Sorry, close to three days. You know, it's weird. It's just like, I'm like, what is happening to me? Mm -hmm. And then when when it finally subsided, it kind of still lingered. Mm -hmm. And it lingered. And that was when I started realizing that, oh, shit, I've been... I've I've been I've been experiencing anxiety all this mm, while yeah. and I didn't know, you mm-hmm. know. And every now and then I get this weird taste in my mouth <laughs> of like 
mm-hmm. metal, you know. Whenever I start, whenever I get anxious about something, I would oh, get this, yeah, I would get this weird taste of me- metal in my mouth. Yeah. And I started Googling it and and um, reading. Is that a like bunch. a symptom of anxiety? I think so, yeah. yeah. I don't think it is for everybody, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, I started just looking up things about it and mm-hmm. I realized that, oh, wow this is what's happening but mm-hmm. i have decided to like take care of it f- for a while by myself even mm-hmm. though i think i need help <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know and i i one thing i do is that whenever i wake up in the morning and i recommend this for a lot of people i just go outside yeah yeah i go outside even if it's for like five minutes okay. i just go outside and i see people mm-hmm. i see people um, being busy, <laughs> I see mm-hmm. people working with their children. I see people just relaxing too. I see people just mm-hmm. doing regular yeah. things, and I'm like, okay, I'm not just alone trying to <laughs> trying to survive by myself. Yeah, there are people like me, and everybody is is is, is not necessarily going through something, but everybody's just. We're, just, we're all moving together, you know. Yeah. So if I drop the ball on folks. something, I'm good, you know. I'll be, I won't yeah. die, you know. A lot <laughs> of know? folks probably have anxiety. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think my if mom ever hears this, I think <laughs> my mom has probably some hardcore anxiety. Interesting. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Yeah. Uh, and, I'm gonna and, you know, edit. My, my well, I can edit whatever me, you want me to edit. You yeah. know, my one of I uh, I actually have a couple therapists because mm-hmm. of an insurance thing mm-hmm. and because you know um, I'm fortunate to get some help to see yeah. one of one of them uh get some help financially to see yeah. one of them but like one of them was talking about the genetic roots of anxiety mm-hmm. that there can be a genetic basis um that's what i was told mm-hmm. and also that like there can be i guess your your own like there your it doesn't have to be that just because you have a i guess genetic predisposition towards it that you will you'll have it but there could be like something else in your life that could that could trigger it too mm-hmm. I and mean, i've actually um talked to uh, one of my mentors, David Baker, who's who passed away, mm-hmm. um, uh, his his wife, uh, widow uh, Lida Baker, is living in Bloomington, Indiana, and I'm bringing her up because she and I had a good conversation mm-hmm. maybe last year or two years ago or something where she was like saying how she all of a sudden in her 50s developed some kind of um, like panic response i think it's safe to say in mm-hmm. an elevator like like what she she goes in elevator she's just like like i gotta get out of here mm. and it would never been any other time in her life and she said you can just have it come out or develop at when at a later age you know and mm-hmm. maybe like this maybe a psychotherapeutic approach might be to find your childhood roots and like what does that have a a, a a basis in your childhood or something that happened in the past mm-hmm. or is it something else you know i think um i was under a lot of stress from like several angles i think mm-hmm. that's what i where i relate to especially in your story is like having mm-hmm. some major stressors yeah and then um you know I my psychiatrist would say like yeah. oh you just uh you you got overwhelmed by all the stress and yeah. I, I hope that's right <laughs> I think that's mm-hmm. right I don't I know think we're, so we're, too. we're working like, it out put, like it's pressure a thing. It's like a thing. we like self induced pressure like yes. putting pressure on yourself I want to do this I want to do that I want to get this done and I'm gonna worry about yeah. this I'm gonna worry about this I'm gonna worry Absolutely. about ten years down the line what's gonna happen I to did me that you know? a lot. <laughs> I, I do, yeah, I, yeah. I'm I, trying to like stop doing that, and it's like it, it's whenever I, when I'm I can get control of mm-hmm. myself and tell myself don't do this, it feels good. Mm-hmm. But every now and then I I let it go and I start doing it again. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I w- I'll just say for for the benefit of anyone that's listening or will listen to this, like mm-hmm. um, one therapist I have specializes in EMDR, which is a you know a treatment modality mm-hmm. or protocol that helps people with it could be trauma especially it's effective with trauma but mm-hmm. it also helps really it seems like it helps any kind of emotion that bothers you mm-hmm. or, or part of yourself that's that you you feel bad about or or are having trouble with um yeah i think that's those are good those yeah. are fine phrases to use and then i have another therapist that did that did mindfulness training with me um so i have the two people and they kind of complement each other mm-hmm. and so for me the mindfulness training has been helpful in the way that you said like sometimes your mind i mean like going to that anxious place is a thing that can happen 
almost every day Mm -hmm. or it can happen. You know, maybe some days are better than others. Um, And for me, sometimes the idea that I've been told from therapists, like you can go two steps forward, one step back, or Mm -hmm. you can go three steps forward, two steps back, Mm -hmm. or you could go two steps forward, three steps back. Mm -hmm. Like some days you go backwards and you're like, Oh, we're, we're, we've mm-hmm. gone backwards like mm-hmm. it's worse and mm-hmm. then, then other days you you feel good so yeah. um i think it's whatever works for you like when you mentioned going outside i mean i think there's some paper i want to read about this where it's like studying depression rates and yeah. linking it to um nature and and the absence of being in nature mm-hmm. and yeah sometimes i go yeah maybe um the society, yeah, maybe we're pretty alienated from nature at this yeah, point. Yeah. And what is the effect of that? It's got to be, there's got to be something considering mm-hmm. our our species and genetic uh, mm-hmm. evolutionary history. I, I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical about some aspects of evolutionary psychology, but it's like mm-hmm. we did come from nature, yes, like yeah. the natural world, so yes. to speak. So like, it's got to, there's got to be a basis there to be like, I need to get out mm-hmm. of this building and get outside. And, you know, and I have a similar morning ritual of like, getting up and getting coffee or and a croissant from this one place near mm-hmm. my house and feeling like I, I'm just being social in a, in a limited way. Yes. And I'm, and I'm, um, you know, I'm just going to familiar places yeah. for me. I think familiarity and home, there's just certain places that I feel comfortable or certain yes. things that I do that make me feel comfortable. So I guess being aware of that and going, oh, I'm going to do this thing that makes me feel good today. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. those are all managing all answers or uh, meanings yeah. to pass through each other. Yeah. And, and like, we're going to be open and we're not going to necessarily find one answer. We, mm-hmm. There may be a plurality of yeah. answers. Yeah. And, that's, and they're going to converge to mm-hmm. maybe one un- unit of mm-hmm. knowledge that yes. might not be homogeneous, it might be yeah. heterogeneous, but it's still one unit. You can, yeah. can be consumed as one unit. Totally. I see. Totally. Mm. I, it's even applying my therapy sessions yeah. in a way like um, <laughs> this idea of, uh, I won't go on and on about this, but just like mm-hmm. this. Um, I'm told through my therapist that practices EMDR that, that this idea of parts in mm-hmm. oneself is a major component of the theory of EMDR. And it's also... Um, something that's been like a big theoretical development in the past 25 years or so of psychology. Mm -hmm. And this idea of like, we all have these multiple parts of ourselves or multiple experiences. You know, we we're as human beings, we're subject, we're subjected to or experience many different um, events in our lives. And maybe we react one way in one instance and we react a different way in another instance. Mm -hmm. And those are all like valid parts or responses of ourselves. And so it's like how to work with these parts. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a sort of, I think in this theory, there's like, you are, you are in control, quote unquote, like you can, you have a degree, you can choose which part you want to sort of manifest or, or, or bring out, let's say, Mm -hmm. but um, EMDR is like working with the parts, you know, it can work with parts that feel bad or or whatever. And, and so this feeds right into dialogical thinking, which Mm -hmm. um, I had been inspired with the album by, um, this psychologist named Hubert Hermans, I think he's Dutch and he came up with this idea of the dialogical self. And it's basically, it's, I think it's parts. It's mm-hmm. in its essence, it's like you have all these different parts of yeah. yourselves and they respond in different situations. And so that plurality, there's some kind of essential unity within it. I think where it's like, it's you, but it's, there's many parts of you. Mm-hmm. And for me, this is like a, a useful way to think because man i mean it's like we've all got different parts and we all respond yeah. differently yeah and so yeah that that was that was something that motivated me uh or not must say motivated me but inspired me for this album to go like how can i explore this idea yeah you know? and you <laughs> you did explore it and uh, <laughs> i was seriously <laughs> i was like some people like it some people want that's okay it's no it's uh, like I'm just, i've been it funny yeah i've i've listened to the whole album maybe Close to twice, but not mm-hmm. fully twice. Um, it gives... I don't know if I'm using the right term, but it mm-hmm. it gives me a theme of um, long form. Like... Yeah. You're yeah. not like... Sorry. You're not like scared to go into that long form mm-hmm. and take it to wherever it takes you. Mm-hmm. Which is one thing I really like about it. Oh, and... Nice. Um, glad. um Another thing I was looking at, I should have done, I should have taken time to like look at the meanings of. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> meanings of the titles. It's I mean, but I cannot remember. I can't. I can't. 
and the, the one that that gives me that um i kept rewinding all there's that one track that you gravitate to in mm-hmm. any album yeah, you take too. um the anthropocene anthropocene I anthropocene think. yeah 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 uh, yeah anthropocene has to do with geological age isn't it? yeah uh, the yeah exactly yeah. Okay. The, um the idea so there's this debate with of like well i guess i should start back up a step mm-hmm. the, you know like the idea that humans are changing mm-hmm. the climate mm-hmm. and we're entering a new geological could, period mm. of of planetary history yeah. that is predominantly driven by human activity and i mean we could even take go more fine grade with this because like do, do you call it um do you call it the anthropocene which one one way of one interpretation of that would be just that Oh, human beings did this, and and um, it's just it's just an outcome of humanity itself. Mm-hmm. Not really, because it's a, it's a product of industrialized nations, particularly industrialized Western mm-hmm. nations, who caused the majority of the climate change. Yeah. So, like, th- fr- from a, a socialist point of view, it would be the capitalocene, mm-hmm. which is kind of a really unwieldy word, but going capitalism industrial production of the past 250 years caused this mm. so i'm getting political in the way that maybe yeah, yeah. i won't go too deeply into you but this go word wherever. This okay is good space. yeah <laughs> well there the, the 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 word anthropocene i think now is like the the way that most people refer to this era yeah and the idea that that is human industrial um activity that has reformed the the planet and will be for a long time to come and that like even when they're looking in like I mean there's like isotopes in 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 soil and rocks that they could So yeah, answer. yeah, I get it. Uh, I mean, it's deep, <laughs> it's deep and uh, dialogical. We got to go deep from a deep perspective, mm-hmm. sometimes from a very straightforward, hey, this is the truth perspective. Like, mm-hmm. he hit it with an aphorism, mm-hmm. which brings us to aphoristic, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, totally. <laughs> uh, like, um What's that's the aphorism that I always think of? Uh, power corrupts absolute. Pa- power corrupts absolutely. Yep. To bring it back to the beginning. Of exactly. Earth, I don't know if that my works. aphorism would just be, "Don't fuck up the earth, <laughs> save the planet." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you said the end, right? The, the oh, well, that's I like that. Don't fuck up the end. I was going. I was going for don't fuck up the earth. <laughs> oh, the earth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be yeah. good. Be good. Be good. Be good. <laughs> try to be good. Just not, not like perfect. Just try to be decent. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'll I'll tell a little digression that, that people might find interesting. I don't know. Um, I was just inspired by uh, a couple different things. Like my mom will mm-hmm. have a lot of like just sayings, and I'll, I was thinking about like how these sayings can like shape your life and how yeah. they can influence the way that you see the world. Um, you know, with like anxiety, like um, yeah. maybe she would say like, well, whatever it's going to be is going to be, or um, if 
it's supposed to be this way, it'll turn out this way. I, you know, yeah. I'm just saying people have like sayings. And yes, things, yeah. But they, it's a coping device. To, to and sometimes there's so much truth in that. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's there can so be, much truth. Particularly you know, in you know. like I think like folk yeah. sayings of. You know, there's like a deep repository in every culture of yeah. this kind of thing. And yeah. like relating to that culture involves yeah. relating to those deep metaphors or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a whole thing, but that's a whole long discussion, which is beautiful. But um mm-hmm. there's there's aphorisms like that and then um you know, my first album, Individuation, was inspired by kind of some of Carl Jung's ideas about individuation, and some mm-hmm. people might go, Oh god, Carl Jung. I, I like a, a lot of aspects of Carl Jung. Mm-hmm. Um not everything, but I like, you know, a lot of it's attractive to me, the ideas, and like, um, particularly about personality and his personality theory and all that stuff. Again, some people are going to go, oh, God, but whatever, let's keep going. So, <laughs> you know, he, um, he's, he, because he's like focusing on archetypal psychology in some ways, like let's look at the signs and symbols that recur and that have like universal um, appearances of throughout human culture. Yeah. Like w- th- this, this involves going into the past, you know, pa- like looking into the past and, and as well as the present mm-hmm. and like, like um, how do, what, what does water, like let's water, let's say in some cultures it's a maternal symbol or is it a symbol of emotions? Like, I mean, this that one could construct or, or or construe these ideas, you know, like that's the like the is the archetype of water, the archetype of the mother, and all this stuff. Um, so, like, there was there's a So yeah, the, af- af- the aphorism was the ba da ba ba, yeah, ba da ba or like yeah. little f- punchy phrases. Phrases. At a fo- at a point, it it it's a little filmic to me. Like at oh good. Yeah, it was like it was like like a film. Yeah, like like a, it's like a film, like a movie. Like I'm watching. Another a movie. friend of mine said he felt it was uh, cinematic, and I and I wondered about that. Same thing. Um, yeah. Because I think sometimes with those the tunes, the way they're written, there there's um. I would call it episodic, like mm-hmm. instead of like like a, a lot of standards that we love. Mm-hmm. You know, you were talking about as time goes by, or yeah. here, like um, that's a tune that's a standard, and it's in like probably A A B A, uh, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you have these Usually, small yeah. forms yeah. that are thirty-two or, yeah. or thirty-six or forty-eight or sixty-four mm-hmm. bars, and you know, I I kind of got interested in like. Um, like forms that might be like instead of A A B A, they might be like A B C D E mm-hmm. D F or something. You know, like like a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, and that also, I didn't like. That's from a friend of mine, John Crowley, who's a trumpet player on on the album. He's one of my best friends. Yeah. We've been talking about this for years of like a form in jazz and like what can we do that's different? What can mm-hmm. we do that's like um, you know, the head format, the head solo head format works for a reason. Like I think it's 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 makes sense. Yes. You know, because people can hear that you're like um, 
here's the statement of, of the theme, and then yeah. we're going to improvise in this moment on that off of that material, like mm-hmm. whether it's the melody or the harmony of the tune, mm-hmm. and then we're going to come back to it again. Yes, but um, there might be another way of doing it where you know, like the free jazz yeah. um, era opened that up totally because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they're like, well, there is no more form now after. Or you know, some people could say you could create you create your own form with your every performance. Like yeah. you're you're creating the form, but like there the free jazz um, uh, development in it is very important for that. Like in terms of form, I think in jazz, and mm-hmm. so um, this is this I guess is like more of a through composed kind of form. So yeah. I don't know. Like sometimes my tunes are like you know the piano part might be. I have it's, to write out a, material. Yeah, um, and then somebody got to play though. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Like okay, a song like um, first track. Juno, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that music, but at the musician in me is not letting me go with the time signature. At okay. some point in time, okay. the time is like, is this eleven? Is this seven? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and so, it changes too. Yeah, it changes. I'm like, okay, 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 but that's one i another one i i really enjoy and then yeah. um there's this one the simplicity mechanical errors yeah 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 i i also like like oh, that. Nice. yeah that yeah. one yeah it's which like, is a free improvisation with yes cheryl. yeah, yeah. Mm. so and like cheryl and i had been playing I'll, I'll say a bit about her because she's a she's a special musician in my life now mm-hmm. um she's she's hired me and we've played together for like um four or five years now and okay. she gave me the opportunity to play with a uh, amazing musician Bern nix who mm. was the great harmonic one of the few harmonic guitar players mm-hmm. who played in like Ornette Coleman's band and also played in that style you know like I I got to hang with him a little bit shortly before he passed he 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 had an untimely passing at like Mm. um, I think he was almost 70 but he he passed away in in May of 2016 and and Cheryl and I did his last date with him which is kind of in some ways perhaps morbid but also heavy for it's like where you play like you have this person that you feel should be well known and like mm-hmm. they play their last date and you're like wow I was mm-hmm. on that that's kind of cool um, in a way I don't know yeah, historically to yeah. me don't take that the wrong way people. no I understand, <laughs> I, understand. Uh, I wish he I, I wish yeah. he, was, he was still around because he was an amazing harmonic voice and an artist um, but I you know she would hire me to play gigs and he would be on them and I tried to learn from him and mm-hmm. um in terms of like he was such a um, so you know he was he was an ab- abstract improviser but ha- he was grounded in like straight ahead playing he could mm-hmm. play straight ahead and he he would you know he talked about like playing with Ornette he, t- he said like he talked about opening um, opposite of Art Blakey in the seventies and how yeah. like they like Ornette's band I guess looked sort of like hippies or maybe they were dressed in like quasi Africana mm-hmm. garb. I don't know, but they like, they looked like the hippies in comparison to like Art Blakey's band was in suits yeah. and, and or that, I'm sorry, we're not, um, burn thought he was like, this is the bebop of the future. Mm-hmm. And he thought that it was, this was going to be this thing would take off and it, and, and it never really did in that way. And, and I think later he kind of rude that, but he was a very, uh, smart, funny, witty, um, quiet person, but he was the kind of person who was very observant, and he, his own style. Like mm-hmm. if you tried to, if you tried to follow him as an improviser, I mean, he could be really abstract, and he would play mm-hmm. stuff that I would go like, I don't know what that was, <laughs> I don't know how you got that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would just like bubble out, and, mm-hmm. and I, um, I thought of him as like he. It's like metaphorically, he would just if you tried to follow him, he would disappear and pop up somewhere else in the room, <laughs> like you know, it's like chasing a ghost. Yeah. Just, Almost, yeah. That's I've never well, thought of. Yeah, he had, I, I call it vaporous, but mm. it's like this ghostly quality when mm-hmm. he played. Anyway, getting to interact with him was a, was a privilege. What's and his name again? Burn Nix. Burn um, Nix. Okay. He was in, he lived in New York for a long time mm-hmm. and was here um, probably since the '60s or at least the '70s. Mm. And he was he, he was in Ornette's uh, Ornette Coleman's primetime band for like 13 or 14 years. Um, with like Jamalini and Takuma on bass, mm-hmm. and um, Calvin Weston was in that band and. I'm not sure who else. I mean, I think Donardo might have been in primetime for a while, but 
Um, Cheryl got me playing with him, and Cheryl and I have played even more. Like we've mm. played a lot of gigs since then. He wasn't always on them, but um, yeah. when he was alive, I think she tried to have him on everything that she could because she they were very close and, oh, okay. and good friends. And but Cheryl and I have a chemistry. I feel like when we play free, um, where like we, we're not starting with any material, we just play, and mm. so. That morning we had walked, she, she was like, ah, I got to get to the studio at 1030, man. You know, like it was yeah. like early, it's jazz musician time. Yeah. And, and, and she, we also had this, we also had temporalities to do. We had to lay down flute parts, but yeah. we just, I think it was all the same day. We improvised just like three little free improvisations mm-hmm. and one of them I cut and two of them I kept. And, and that one was just, that was um, I wanted to document our chemistry, and I was reading yeah. this book, which I don't understand, but it was some um, Felix Guattari, the philosopher that was um, Deleuze's frequent intellectual partner, um, and and it's it's a book about writings on Japan. It's called mm. Machinic Eros. Mm. Why not? I'm going to go one step further. Sorry, people, if I'm rambling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had had these dreams a few years ago that involved like cybernetic female figures okay which is, uh probably sounds really weird oh uh, it's okay nothing is well, <laughs> weird <anymore. laughs> um like what is michael into um <laughs> and it, like you know anyway i just think this idea of like the the if we construe femininity mm-hmm. as eros consciousness and this is already a stretch but like like eros means like connection mm-hmm. um it could mean love, but it also means like in union thought, it means like the force that um, like logos sort of separates and analyzes and, mm-hmm. and it, you know, and like in Christianity in the beginning, there was the word and the word is sometimes translated as logos. Yeah. Um, I think logos can also mean truth or meaning, mm-hmm. but like the, the, the logos consciousness sort of like, you know, divides and separates and, and analyzes, whereas the arrows consciousness unites and 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 brings together, and, and it's this sense of we all belong and are are within one another. I mm-hmm. think um, that's the, again the Jungian view. Eros can have a lot of different meanings, but my thought is in modern life um, we are well. First of all, this idea of the the feminine as this nurturing. Uh, er- eros based consciousness mm-hmm. of of uh like the mother figure but then mm-hmm. also the machine which could be cold or mm. forbidding mm. or alien mm. so like in you know metroid and uh the video game metroid mother brain is yeah. an example of a, of a of a she's a she's an evil cybernetic woman who's mm. very powerful yeah and that was that's an interesting dark archetype but uh, there's also the just we are like in the modern world today we're we're like dating through apps we relate mm. to people through machines and so I was thinking about how prescient this phrase was because yeah. it's like our sense of connection yeah. in in industrialized society is through machines Machine. and yeah. it is that is that alienation yeah. or is that like um, where is that going? I guess mm. I'm, I'm asking. Or so anyway, I was what we played about that. Hell no, it was just a bunch of notes. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it but came out I beautifully. Like these themes yeah, I because like it, it yeah. makes you. I, I see your post on, on Facebook and I know you're into, <laughs> you're into politics. Uh, so I want us to talk about, um, 
I don't know. How are you feeling about uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Libra? Oh, no. Maybe right. I should just ask you about one person. No. You know. Oh uh, no! Oh no! Okay. You're, yeah, you're a Bernie person, right? Um, that's actually there. I have a lot to say about okay. that. Um, okay. Yes, I would. If if Bernie Sanders gets the Democratic nomination, yeah. I would probably vote for him. Okay. For me, it would be between Bernie Sanders or Howie Hawkins for the okay. Green Party. Who is how? How? Who is Howie Hawkins? Howie Hawkins is a a longtime um, Green Party uh, politician. Okay. okay, Michael. Yeah. It got to be a de- either a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> it's two parties to the system. A Green, green Party is not going to do it this time. Like one woman said, <laughs> one woman, one black woman, she said, this time we need a seasoned warrior because we're going against the Antichrist. And I, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And I kind of believe, I kind of agree with her. But what I'm saying is that mm-hmm. I'm all for voting for third party mm-hmm. for exploring, mm-hmm. but not this time. Do you agree with me or you don't? For voting for third party, um, I guess it's like how honest do I want to be with? This I mean, it's with we when you vote like in the primary, I don't mind voting for anybody. Like uh-huh. I'm actually leaning. This is gonna sound crazy. I'm actually leaning towards Marion Williamson. Sure, yeah, a little sure. bit now. Uh, uh-huh. I'm I kind of see it for Elizabeth Warren at the same sure. time, you know. But Marion Williamson, she touches my heart. Okay. You know, she when she says the things she says, I'm like, okay, nobody has ever approached it from this perspective. Okay. You know. But I don't know if I'm gonna step out of the Democratic Party in the general election and vote for somebody mm-hmm. who I know is not gonna win. Right. Just to make a statement. You know what I mean? Right. Well, for me it's not even just about making a statement. Um it's like trying to promote a Social democratic mm-hmm. um, approach, society, okay. a society. Um, I just I think that like the both the Democratic and Republican parties are fundamentally broken. Okay, and the system is um, in a very bad place. And I agree with you that Donald Trump is um, a <laughs> horror. Yeah, and um, hopefully will be defeated immediately. It, um, I think there's a good chance he'll win in 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, I also understand um, Marianne Williamson. I mean, I used to actually be into A Course in Miracles a little bit, which mm. she teaches. Hmm. Um, yeah, um, and I, th- I think it's also refreshing that she, for example, um, does say things that don't get said. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I, I, for me, it's about trying to promote the, the ideas that I think should be... Um, the, the, like we should have a social democracy in the United States, like, mm-hmm. like everywhere else in the world. Yeah. Um, I understand beating Trump. I what I what I would say is, um, hopefully, like I you know Bernie made a choice, for example, to run in the Democratic Party, and mm-hmm. and, and he. I was critical of that in 2016, but mm-hmm. he has made a difference in shifting yes. American politics towards mm-hmm. a more openly like when he uses the word socialist he actually yeah. means social democracy yes. which is like instead of revolutionary socialism like like leninism or trotskyism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right um so i think he's made a difference and it maybe it's possible that the democratic party can be reformed in the direction that he wants to go to yeah um i i understand what you mean of as like a, um, a strategic um vote to like anybody but trump mm-hmm. and um i can even i understand it and uh, perhaps when I get to the voting booth, that's yeah. what I'll do. Like I'm, I'm leaving it. I'm leaving it a little bit open. Um, like I, I, like I said, I think Trump. I thought for a long time Trump was a proto-fascist. Like he was not going to um, necessarily be. He he's too ideologically incoherent and has like he's he's oppor- an opportunist and like he doesn't mm-hmm. really have a consistent yeah he does um, yeah position. and that's the problem that's yeah. the problem he's just a day trader mm-hmm. i mean even if, if you're racist I mean, he's, a, he's a disgusting horrible yeah, person yeah. i mean and i have it's no just, problem saying that i mean it's like uh, like just looking at it's like he's horrible he's a horrible person mm-hmm. and i'm not afraid of saying that yeah. i mean um i don't wish him 
necessarily harm. I'm just saying he's a horrible person. I would have never voted for him in a million in ever. I mean, it's just unthinkable from my position. <laughs> yeah, I understand why people did because they. I he, don't. Though. He was. He was saying. <laughs> there's a po- part of it is like racism. I mean, I kind of, of understand in that part in of it is yeah. um, right wing populism, mm-hmm. which he's saying things like you've lost your jobs. Yeah, and we need and like we need to bring them back, even though yeah. the what he was doing was never possible. Like he was not going to bring coal back. He was mm-hmm. not going to like. But why is it that but if he's saying people mm-hmm. keep saying that people voted for Trump because of poli- mm-hmm. uh, economic anxiety and all those things. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the average black person and the average white person, mm-hmm. if you compare them, the average black person is the person going through a harder economic strife than the the average white person. Uh-huh. But why is it that the average black person didn't vote for Trump? Why is it that the black people didn't vote for Trump? Because if you talk about some people that might be amenable, that might respond respond to um, economic promises, it will be people who are suffering, who are going through more economic hardship, like mm-hmm. black people in yes. this country. But they didn't vote for him, so right. I don't agree when people they voted say for Hillary. Correct? Yeah, right. I don't I agree wondering. when people say, "Oh, people voted for Trump because because he was promising all these things and he will bring the jobs back and everything." I think they voted for him. Because they liked the uh, racist things and the uh, socially um, uh, crazy things he was saying and Mm. that he promised to do and that he has done. I think that's the main reason why the, some other people voted for him for some other reasons. They mm-hmm. think that, oh, well, he's a Republican. He's going to go with the Republican. Whatever the Republicans tell him to do, he's going to cut our taxes. And yeah, mm-hmm. that's understandable too. But majority, like, I feel like I believe majority of the um, uh, evangelical people that voted for him, they voted for him because they like the things they that like he was saying the like that he's gonna deport the yeah he's gonna figure, deport the the mexicans like the father he's gonna, figure yeah he's gonna, of, yeah he's gonna deport the yeah. mexican he's gonna and like uh ban muslims giving, and all those expressing things. their yeah racist antipathies yeah um yeah <laughs> and that i think that's all true as well um especially from like middle class white people which yeah is a core part of his like the breakdown just statistically i don't know how much time we have but like mm-hmm. you know um, we still have to talk about your your, your <laughs> new album so Ah, uh, this is better. Let's no, make it quick, and um, then use but, um, like three. You know, there three. were like mi- middle class white people. There were white women. Mm-hmm. There were also there's a certain percentage of Hispanic voters that voted for him too. Like yeah. The breakdown of this is is interesting, and so for a long time I sort of was like, this guy is not really a fascist, but he's close. And, and he's not a classical fascist either, like mm-hmm. in the sense of like a Mussolini or Hitler. Yeah, or, or, he has or, no principles. Whatever. It's just like, yeah. come on, those th- those are the, those people that have done horrible things in the world, done racist things. Some of them have principles mm-hmm. that they're able to like lay down and say, "This is yeah. why I'm doing this. This is exactly. why I'm doing this." And then you can know how to attack them, mm-hmm. or you. It's kind of yeah. You can know how to you attack know them. You know where they stand. Mm-hmm. You can analyze them. But yeah. he, he's just an empty person that mm-hmm. has no... Uh. So I, there's a couple things I would say, and, yeah. and maybe it'll tie it all together for yeah. me. There are recent events, um, not only the absolutely obscene situation of like people in cages, but mm-hmm. the, um, his, his attacks on the squad, which are pretty much openly racist, mm-hmm. um, hit... Uh, and I'm going to space on there on uh, recent events that, but there are a number of things recently that have happened, which I think essentially cross over into fascism. And he's also, you know, he's had white nationalists or, or, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, far, far right wingers. And in the sense of being essentially fascist of like uh, Miller and Bannon who have advised him. Mm-hmm. And it's always like, who does he surround himself with? But um, the second thing I would say just to tie this up is that I've, I've been concerned that the, he he's horrific enough, but like, mm-hmm. who will they bring out next? Will they? Mm-hmm. Will it be an open Nazi or somebody like that, I, or or mm-hmm. somebody that's a fascist enough that, that mm-hmm. they will get stuff done from there? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They will crack crack down in in uh, super authoritarian mm-hmm. right wing ways, or will it be? What will that be? And then are the Democrats going to be able to? defeat that um and will the democrats be able to move 
like in a, in a in a in a social democratic direction, which I think could, like I think Bernie would have beaten Trump, and I think Bernie could beat Trump, mm-hmm. possibly, maybe Elizabeth Warren can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I you know I'm just saying like I think that Sanders had the right mix. Yeah. I'm one of those people who thinks that, and I'm not like an enormous Bernie like Bernie bro or Bernie fan. Mm-hmm. I I actually voted for Stein in the last election, and I, you know. But you in, you voted in New York, right? I did. Okay, yeah. so we can forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think like there's going to have to be a fundamental restructuring of of like the Democratic Party in terms yeah. of like social uh, democracy. That I agree with. And um, so yeah, in defeating Trump. Mm-hmm. Is is one point, and then the climate is another because it is an absolute state I of totally cl- climate emergency. Yeah. and that's what I'm really concerned about too is um, the climate and and doing something real and substantive about it. And then also, wh- what will capital do in terms of using the climate to to um, push its 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 profit making. Uh, modus operandi how will it take advantage of the situation and worsen mm-hmm. it and also how will, how will how will fascist or police state uh situations emerge in in the wake of climate change because this is like you know it it will it, it will involve mass um like like there's going to be when the when the himalayan glaciers melt for mm-hmm. instance there's going to be like 1.5 billion people who won't have drinking water and, and that's like talking about like we're talking about killing a billion indian people which mm-hmm. is a uh, genocide it's it's yeah. on the scale of it's unimaginable and so like how will the government respond and what will they do like they were gonna, I, just, I i bring up india as an example of that but there mm-hmm. will be so many places in the world yeah. where these yeah. kinds of um, really extreme limit breaking situations occur and like mm-hmm. how will we respond will we respond in a way that has some semblance of of um democracy and and um uh you know, like working together in, yeah. in some kind of left way, or will it be? But wait, mm-hmm. this is this things you're talking about is already happening, though. In in like mean? the effect of climate change is mm-hmm. at all. It's already happening. Like oh yes, oh absolutely. it's not just it's not just it doesn't just manifest itself in 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 the weather or whatever or r- r- flood and all it. All those things lead to um lack of resources for people mm-hmm. those things lead to which leads to uh, scarcity which leads to war yeah Amen. which leads I mean, to people is, trying to migrate uh, which fact. leads to people being children being caged so mm-hmm. it's already chaotic it's already happening but we're yes. just oh, we're I, just I, in need I just completely agree with you yeah just because we live we're able to like be in a place where we're not seeing a huge brunt of the effect, we feel like it's not happening. It's mm-hmm. happening all over the world. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're already in yeah. in, in 1.5 C, uh, 1.5 Celsius above the you know what what the what the temperature mark markers yeah. or benchmarks are, and it's it's gonna get to two. It's really when it gets to like what I'm reading is when it gets to four. That's when like life on Earth will not be possible. Four mm-hmm. to five is going to be a huge like like all sorts of things could be set in motion. I'm sorry to be so dark at the end of the interview. I mean, but that's, that's but fine. that's what I mean. Like the political challenge of yeah. doing that is so important. So I'm I'm, you know, for for me that like, whoever is, like the climate is a big issue and mm-hmm. beating 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 a burgeoning very ugly, uh, politically scary. Um, proto-fascist movement in the United States uh, or or if it's not a movement but like like having an answer to that and being mm-hmm. like we, we're united we're going to help you we're going yeah. to have programs that help you um, that's my that's part of my answer for that you know? okay well said well thank you I hope I nicely said, said. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about your upcoming project yes can you say a few things about it I, I haven't had it so it's okay. all you. Like, I'll keep let's it, take I'll keep three it, minutes. I'll keep it short and punchy. Yeah. Um, this band is called Tenor Triage. Uh, okay. It's with Sean Sondreger and James Brandon Lewis on saxophones, tenor saxophones, and yeah. it's tenor saxophone and soprano. It's Brad Jones on bass and Calvin Weston on drums. We have an album coming out on Rope Dope Records. I'm really excited to be working with Rope Dope. Okay. It's on September 13th, and it's like a combination of like um, some free jazz, a little bit of free jazz, but mm-hmm. more like groove. Um, based music and and uh modern jazz put together and we're we work as a band like it's a three tenors kind of project yeah it's going to be coming out and we'll probably play a concert or something coming okay soon, like a do you have a, a song i can 
play us out with? From that record? Yeah. Totally. What is it called? Um, this is this is Sean Sondreger's tune, and it's called The Beatdown. The Beatdown. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. Michael Eaton, this has been wonderful. I really, really enjoyed this out. Thank our, you. I always I enjoy our conversation. <laughs> of course. <laughs> we're like stronger friends after this. Good. I like our conversations. Like, Thank you. We, we're able to go wherever. <laughs>